next Endo meeting on September 11th of 2024. Today's topic is eventual send past, present, and future. And uh, our and Michael Fig will be presenting. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, so I was going to start with a little demonstration of uh, where the eventual send proposal is headed. And um, just to show you how it's structured, it's a little slideshow I have too. Uh, so I'll just show off something in my shared screen. So I have this thing in Yarn Dev in the Endo Evaluator repository, which is in Endo.js like other things. I mean, this likes to say you can access properties of O or an arbitrary object with OX. So what this O thing is, it is what E is, but just manipulated so that it's more um, consistent. And uh, if anybody's used E, it looks, if we did something like this, then we could say E of uh, a number and invoke a two-string method on it. And you get back something that vaguely resembles a promise. In the E operator, it always gives you back a promise. But O gives you back a proxy, which has a then method on it and some various proxy traps. So if we await this thing, then we get back the string. Um, O also gives us the ability to um, set values. So it's like a pet namespace, essentially. So I can say, oh, uh, Nick is Chris. And then if I try to dig it out of the O again, I only get back the proxy. So essentially, O absorbs everything and sticks it behind the intervals so that the only way you can interact with the things on the other side is to await them or to chain the operations. Um, so I could slice this stick name uh, and await that thing. And I get back his from Chris's name. So always arbitrarily chainable. Um, you can call O on a function. What's somebody's favorite function? Uh, let's make a function that adds, multiply something by two. Call that on number four. A uh, question? Yes. Uh, the REPL that we're looking at, this is just, this is a, a normal node REPL or this is your custom REPL? This is just a normal node REPL. That's why these proxies tend to show up. Okay, that's what I thought. That's okay. Okay, very interesting. Um, uh, so, so good. I'm glad we're seeing this first. But it, I think uh, it, uh, if we have time, it would also be enlightening uh, if you could show off uh, the enhanced functionality uh, with regard to the same O mechanics of uh, your custom rep. Yeah, definitely. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, so the, the other thing that this REPL is able to do is uh, O is essentially usable on remote objects. So uh, if we use the handle promise mechanism, which I'll discuss in a little bit, you can create objects that are proxies for behavior on the other side of a connection, for example. And that's how uh, endo captp works. Um, this is an evaluator in the website instead. And uh, we have O here again, but if I dig things out, you'll see that the, the evaluator here does an automatic wait for us. Um, I have some superpowers in this, in this evaluator. Like there's something called unsafe, 
and it's got some gated properties. But if you, let's say, assign to O an unsafe global this. So there we have a little pop-up for us to say this is unsafe. Corruption and security vulnerabilities are in the way. Um, and so there's an, a global this sticking around. Um, I do this because I want to show you set interval. Um, Here is, let's do that every three seconds. So that's the interval uh, thingy. And while it's running, we can also do like console.log of hello. And that's, we have a little console for each of these spawned processes that we have. So they're running as async functions in the background. So if I want to clear the interval, and that was 167, or we can say dollar three, and that stops things from counting. Um, so this is a little REPL, and you, you have a weight available to you in this REPL. So we can do stuff like uh, a weight new promise with the resolver that calls the um, unsafe global this timeout to resolve after three seconds with an argument of gotcha. Let's resolve. Yeah, sure. We can do that. I match up my friends. Yeah. So we can just create a new promise to do that. And we'll say it's a pending promise. And then it resolves. So this is kind of the experience that people had when they were playing with the Agoric solo um, REPL before, except so, this doesn't well, have an egg solo behind it. OK, there's one thing here that's that I'm very surprised by, which was the um, uh, getting the um, unsafe thing about global this, the uh, you're in general you're you're just I mean you're not interpreting the string or parsing the string, so you're just using lexical lookup for um, you know uh, like the new promise, the capital promise there is just lexically looked up. You're not you're not mm -hmm. inject, but um, so how did so how is it that an unsafe global this is in scope and set timeout is not directly in scope but Thomas is in scope if you're not interpreting or parsing I, I don't understand what I'm saying. Okay, so the unsafe global this was an endowment put into this compartment. So I can show you. Or rather, it's a proxy that you have endowed this compartment with a proxy for the global disk where all accesses are gated on permission from a user prompt. Okay, so, yes. hold, so hold on. This, this, this means you're in a compartment in which the, the compartment's uh, global has a binding for global this, which is not the compartment's that that it's that compartment's global itself. Yes. So, but it's only assigned to O dot GT is my global this alias. But so okay, but, but I, I do have an unsafe that has the actual global this on it. This is just like a diagnostic to say it's gated. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not understanding. You're you're at the, the the strings you're typing in are being evaluated in a compartment. Mm -hmm. That comp that compartment itself 
has a binding for a global this. I'm sorry, that compartment has a global, which is mm -hmm. mostly a safe global. That global yeah. itself does not have that time at all. That's right. That global has an unsafe on it, which is your gateway to unsafe things. Mm -hmm. Does does that global what is so for this the most we'll call that the mostly safe global. What is the mostly safe global binding for global this itself? Not the unsafe dot global this, but the that if you just say global this. This one? Direct. Yeah. What it uh, nope. it has a bunch of unenumerable things that are stuff like and uh, console and stuff. Is the is the is the global this the the, the global this that's in lexical scope? Mm -hmm. Is that pointing at the mostly safe global of the compartment itself? Yes. Okay. So it, it, it was not that. Okay. Good. 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 So you did not endow the mostly safe global with an alternate global this. Right. You endowed the mostly safe global with an unsafe that provided an unsafe global this. Which yeah. Michael then captured in the ozone as big O. Ozone. Oh, no, the ozone. Oh, I didn't see that coming. I should have seen that coming. Um, There's a lot of points. Okay, very, very, <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, very good. Very good. I was I was worried so, that you were you you had directly endowed the mostly safe global with a global this that was something other than the mostly safe global. Yes. So th that that was not the case. And the nice thing about the fact that O is kind of a mutable na namespace for me is that I can do things like delete O dot two D, and then ta da, everything is gone. Oh, that will fall. Okay. Fail. Okay. All right. So I think that we have thrown a lot of people at Meta at MetaMask into a very deep pool. And I want and I, I wonder whether it's even productive to ask, are there any questions at this point? <laughs> do you do you want to expand on what's going on here? Uh, yes. So this is an example of how you can use the various endo tools to create a REPL. And um, what is interesting about it is that from a REPL, you can do uh, most anything that you can. It, the, the question now becomes what kind of, what kind of, uh, object representation do we want of a, of a given API? And anything that's a JavaScript API can be hidden behind uh, eventual sends and gets and stuff like that surfaced across the network or uh, in another VAT on the same machine or whatever it is. And all of that magic is handled by the O operator and its proxies rather than being spread out and you having to make a whole bunch of interfaces async compatible. It's just all done for you. Yeah. Um, Aaron, I think, was reaching for a way to convert, well, related but somewhat tangential, uh, convert an interface guard to the equivalent interface guard where all of the all of the methods of the interface are async. They're they're asynchronous analogs. Since that's the view that you get over CAPTP of an object, regardless of whether it has synchronous methods, um, and yeah, and the, yeah, and this O, this O zone is all async all the time. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, one thing that I didn't point out before. But if I start with a view of one, two, three, that's a promise. Okay. The little REPL doesn't really care about that. It just awaits it and gets something back very quickly. And um, if I then do a two string, let's do 
0.23.45. Being fixed, let's call it four decimal places. Um, that sliced the first three things off. And um, two, this is essentially builder pattern that there's a that you're lifting into a space where you're building a plan to execute a and then to pipeline a whole bunch of promise based or, uh, operations. And then uh, when you await that, that initiates the execution of that pipeline. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's laziness would have to be built into the adapters along the way. Um, the one yeah, here actually does. Yeah. yeah, this is eager, not lazy, lazy correct? correct? Yeah, the, it's eager, but you would have to, you could implement laziness in the proxies that you have. Okay, okay. okay. But, but, but eagerness is, is consistent with the, the um, expectation, expectation from um, uh, promise pipeline. pipeline. This is just basically, basically doing, doing the same kind of builder pattern, pattern if you want to call it that, that promise pipelining does. Yeah, exactly. Mark, I muted one of you. Um, I don't know if it was the right one. Um, no, yeah. I believe I believe what happened was Mark had his mic on a different device than his speaker was on, and so it was causing some feedback. Uh, you're you're correct. I'm now uh, I've now unmuted the correct device, but thank you. Um, uh, Yes. So Dan says in chat that this simplifies interaction with nested e calls, and that is precisely correct. That this this makes yeah. it possible to express um, method invocation pipeline um, in a in a in a much more elegant way than we can currently with the e operator. Yeah. the 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 key, the key enabler here that I had missed for years when when things in this direction had come up is that. Rem the um, uh, remotables already cannot be venables. Uh, if an object, if, a, if a, something that looks like a remotable uh, has a then method, uh, past style it will not classify it as a remotable. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, these, wrap the, these wrappers, um, uh, OCELs, I think, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, themselves could be proxies with then methods so that you can await them without confusing the then with a message that could have been sent to the destination object. The destination object cannot have a then method, and therefore the proxy is free to have a then method without confusion. Yeah, and to give credit, that's why Matthew understood. He figured that out, and I just ran with it further to actually build a proxy like that. So what are the implications for God? I, I want to dig in and ask lots of great detailed questions about this design, but I want to also make sure that uh, the new folks coming in, in the OCAP kernel team who have not been talking about eventual send for years have uh, a place to stand to understand um, and participate in the conversation. So um, what I would ask is, like, what are the implications of this for the underlying primitive that we propose for the language? Like how does how do how do we how do we what what does this imply for what we want to do with um, the evolution of JavaScript itself with regard to promises and promise pipelining and delegated promises? Before I even ask that question, though, I really want to ask, like, Dimitrios, Ryan, where are you starting from? Where, what do we need to say to onboard you to this conversation? I'm really new to this, so I need to understand how how is this going to use in our implementation. Actually, so. Yeah, I understand what you're doing, but how we are gonna use it? I'm not so sure. Why uh, do do uh, does promise pipelining need to be explained? No, that's fantastic. 
Uh, Ryan, you're good for promise pipelining? No, I could use an overview. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I see Captain Proto's website is open on a tab, and they have a great visualization of this. Oh, yeah. what you know? Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that you should mention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and so we all... this diagram explains promise pipelining. And it's basically when you, in traditional RPC, you create a request and you get a return result from your create request. And then you can chain off of that and do something else. But in Captain Proto and any system that has promise pipelining, as soon as you send the re request, the client immediately gets back a promise for the result and can continue doing work, which might be sending another request if you're doing a little bit of work. And then the server gets to respond to those in whatever order it pleases. Um, if it's dependent on uh, one promise, then it can only, then it has to respond to the first request in order, because promises, targets of RPC should honor their e order or the the result of sending messages in a particular order. But it's certainly a lot faster, and like they say. Um, infinitely faster than traditional RPC because you have these evasions of not having, oh yeah, there it is, 150 mic, uh, millis microseconds versus zero microseconds for a buff versus Captain Virgo. Um, uh, I think the, the zero versus, I think the infinitely faster is not a promise pipeline point. I think that's the the non-deserializing point, which is really distinct. Oh, no, they're specifically saying that this is because it does time travel. Calls are returned to their client before the request even arrives at the server. Uh, and that's what their zero, zero yeah, that's it, microseconds it's, it's uh, Somewhat facetious. OK, I'm, I'm yeah. really uncomfortable with, with Talking about that as being infinitely faster. Definitely <laughs> I know, but it's Kenton. He can say that. <laughs> Given an infinitely long series of RPC calls. <laughs> um, on the um, Michael, are you presenting? Yes. Okay. Could you also click on the URL I just put into chat uh, and present that so I can talk to that diagram? And on, and I want to do some hand wavy converse uh, explanation here. The um, the I, I again Ryan and Dimitros, I, you are familiar with promises. Uh, I take that as table stakes at this point, and then um, which is incredible because it was definitely not that way ten years ago. Um, but uh, the the. Uh, a big piece of the idea of a promise is that it creates an abstraction for talking about a value that might be in the past or in the future, right? Um, and it gives you a way to interact with it regardless of whether it's settled in the past or the future. Um, this insight that there's this decoupling in time can be extended to decoupling in space, right? Where um, because all interactions with a promise are asynchronous, um, there's no need for the value behind the promise to exist in the same space. So it also creates, it can be used, Can we can extend the idea of promise, uh, of a promise to be, in general, a prox an async proxy for an object that is local, either here or somewhere else. And we call that a remotable. It's not remote. It might be remote. It's local somewhere, and that might be where you are, but you're going to interact with it as if, as you're going to interact with it as if uh, in the same way, regardless of whether it's in the same process or somewhere else, it's it's being um, fronted by a promise. And because you're fronting it with a promise, if we extend a JavaScript to have some mechanism for forwarding property access or, uh, or, or method invocation on this async proxy, that's what the O cell is doing, um, we can generalize uh we can generalize rpc in a way that allows us to send multiple concurrent messages one message to the response of the previous request in uh and avoid round trip unnecessary round trips and to you mark 
Uh, yeah. I, I just want to demonstrate this once, where if I say gotcha, and then I do slice that of slice three there, and take the, yep. Yeah. Oops. I can't do that. I have to put a print around it. Oh, no, that won't work. Sorry. I, I'll just go back to Mark's feature. Um, because it needs to be an old proxy. Okay. Can't just be a regular promise. Okay, so um, so uh, this is uh, shown in the E language, which has a somewhat different notation. So the conventional RPC explanation uh, that's using uh, notation that's that's essentially the same as JavaScript notation, modulo the colon equals versus the equals for assignment. Um, the on the on the right hand and and um, uh, on the right hand side, the left arrow is the eventual send that uh, corresponds to these purposes. Where you say, let's say, they just take the the inner example, uh, x left arrow a open print close print uh, would be for us. Let's say in this conversation, be capital O open paren x close paren dot a open paren close paren. So it's just doing an eventual send of A to whatever X designates. So, um, and uh, then the, uh, the same expansion uh, applies in both cases for understanding the, the composite expression as being made of those uh, component expressions. Um, and then what the diagram is showing is that the sending of A uh, between VATs, the sending of A remotely, leaves behind T1, which is a promise for what the result of the eventual send to A will be. Um, but uh, the, 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 but because the promise reifies the, um, uh, you know, name, gives a name to, essentially gives a name the protocol, to what that result will be before we know what that result is, um, we can then go ahead and use that name to immediately send the message C over to the other VAT uh, before we get any feedback from the other VAT. Uh, and uh, in this case, there's also, we send the message B over to the other VAT as a message to Y. And now the message C is encoding both using T1 to name the receiver of the message C and using T2 to name the argument of the message C. Uh, so the result is that A, B, and C can all go out in, um, at the same time, can all go out in one network packet uh, and um, uh, thereby doing in one round trip what normally would have taken three round trips. Uh, and the the uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing uh, this diagram is that uh, uh, parallelism in RPCs can have A and B go out at the same time, but just parallelism without promise pipelining would still not be able to send C until you got responses from both A and B. And that's the magic of promise pipelining. And the reason why uh, the reason why round trips is really important is, as Mark likes to say, New York is not getting any closer to Tokyo, and Earth is not getting much closer to Mars. So RPC that has a lot of round trips is deal killer. Yeah, in a and, lot of things. yeah, and I came up with that quote a long time before I ever imagined that we we would be using things like blockchain as our computing nodes. The round trip time to a blockchain has to go through settling the consensus algorithm. So it's it's much more like communicating, you know, to the doing a round trip to the moon than it is doing a round trip to Tokyo. All right. So I think we have some grounding. Uh, and I want to dig in and get some architectural questions out of the way. One of the interesting things about the E operator, which we have not shown today. Um, is the E operator is able to do, it was able to do eventual send and pipelining and just had some ergonomic weaknesses. 
um, when it came to just serial uh, serial pipelining was more difficult to express in that pattern. Um, possible, but more difficult. And uh, Dan asked a question in chat. It was like, why didn't we do this in the first place? Is there something being lost? Um, and I believe the answer to that is that no, nothing is lost. We just realized late that uh, that there was an opportunity laying around because of, because uh, specifically because there was not going to become there was never going to be a way to uh, the, the the then method is just simply reserved by JavaScript. It's not really you're not going to be able to have remote invocation of a then method, um, and because it's reserved, well, we can have that. Uh, we can use that as a, a sigil to indicate that you want to await, uh, or yeah. as, as we can late bind the 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 dropping from ozone to. Uh, Specifically, that it's, re it's reserved by past dialogue is the the key issue. You can't create a remotable that has a then method. Or yeah, we enforce it in past style. Um, we enforce the thing that. that the thing that I brought to the table was realizing that E had you choose between whether you were going to make a method call or going to get a property. At every step along the way, you had to say E of something dot something if you're sending a method. And you had to say E dot get of something dot something if you were going to get a property. Uh, I'll show that in one of the slide pictures here. But what I realized was that if the proxy doesn't even care whether the object you're, you're sending to is callable or dereferenceable as a property, if every proxy target was a function with properties, then we don't have to make that distinction and everything can be can be all loosey-goosey until actually evaluating the stuff in the end. Uh, we've got a clarifying question from Eric in chat. I invite us all to look at the notation. So that yeah. we don't... you might you might be able to just drop his example into the console. I think you got to put his second statement first to assign foo the value of a. Well, he is he is assigning a value for the then function, and, and Chris did just point out it's reserved. So, but I, I think he's saying what if foo is a pending promise for a for a console log. I think that this ends up working out. The then method sent to the result of O is just like awaiting the result of O. Is you're not sending, uh, you're not invoking then on foo. You're just invoking O on, I'm sorry, you're just invoking then on the proxy that O returns. Mm, yeah, which is grounded in foo. So foo is yeah. basically not not a promise, but an intercepts the then method. And, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My question. Yeah. My question was uh, essentially a clarifying question for when we were talking about like uh, what happened when like the the thing you were talking about that uh, Matthew figured out about like the 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 proxy and objects declaring their own uh, then methods and that preventing us from doing this previously. Uh, so I was trying to understand what exactly happens if the um, the target, uh, yeah, if the target declares its own then method that is uh, you know not then uh, then is available. And Zoom uses smart quotes to make us all happy. Uh, right. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, yeah, so I would not actually uh, copy uh, directly. <laughs> I, I will do this. So you'll note that in this case, um, the assignment returned the uh, the value of the assignment and caused this console to invoke the then method, which caused it to console log. Um, that's unrelated. Yeah, so every time I run this, it's just going to hang, but more hellos will show up. To clarify your clarifying question. Yeah. So you can intercept them with O because O isn't really based on eventual send internally. It just happens to use it when it's actually sending messages to objects. So if you supply 
uh, something that's some other um, beast. So um, they'll just my, drop it. So, so architecturally, yeah. Michael, are we talking about? So, so E is a library that stands on top of the eventual send primitive in the language, which were proposed, which we previously proposed as a handled promise constructor. And then that proposal evolved into a promise.delegate uh, uh, constructor function in the spirit of uh, proxy.revocable or revocable. Um, and, uh, and, and, I and I understand that you have a proposal to evolve that further. Is the evolution of the proposal to make O cells the primitive that represents uh, that represents a, an async proxy for a for a remotable, or is the idea for that to also be an alter to merely be another alternative to the e operator in user space to interact with the eventual send underneath it? Um, so we did talk about this, uh, Mark and I, when we were thinking about how to move the proposal forward a bit more. And basically, we want to pro propose something like O to be part of the eventual send proposal, just to make it available as a client for the different eventual operations that you can do. And there's there's really, in the current definition of O, it's, it's not quite a client. It's also a namespace. So we don't want to propose that. We don't want to propose O as a place that you jam arbitrary stuff, even if we're going to use that for that purpose in our in our stuff so um yeah because if there were a global o provided by the language that would be a oh uh, that would le that would leak shared immutable state right yeah so actually i do want to do uh so um have this eventual namespace which has the different operations get apply send and stuff and a couple of other things so i'm defining eventual.client to be an o that's just been hardened so you can't you can't add new stuff to it but you can still use o paren something to do work so that eventual client you would destructure into your own um, scripts and be able to call it whatever you want call it e call it o a lot of the machinations we go through to make this work in modern JavaScript, given that the underlying promise does not support pipelining, um, is hypothetically unnecessary at the language level, where the promise primitive could do pipe uh, could do forwarding of mess arbitrary messages as well. Um, is are we expecting to be able to make a simplification when it's supported by the language, or do we intend to propose something that lives with a, the the scar of the omission of forward message forwarding at the underlying level? So uh, it's I'll, I'll zip over to the slideshow now no, to give a sense of where that is. Um, basically, uh, no, it's too far. Um, this is what O is, is the eventual client API. And it's consistent and it's something pretty that I would love to propose. And this belongs in the eventual send proposal. Um, what number one is, is it attaching eventual handlers to fresh objects. And the promises that can handle eventual operations are just a subset of what kind of objects we would like to and a lot of eventual operations. So uh, even if promises re received a work over and got, them, got themselves queuing messages as part of its behavior, uh, we want to be able to create promises that are able to queue messages for sure. But um, we also want to be able to create other things like proxies or objects or functions that all allow you to queue messages to them as well. So um, that's a distinct layer. And, and um, the, the other part is it's kind of necessary for us to do this to shim properly too, because 
um, promises don't let you know when they've been shortened, when they've been forwarded to another promise. So in the absence of the standard giving us a way of doing that, we have to be able to queue messages to chunks along the way rather than just to the final result of, of a whole chain of promises. Anyway, um, I'll start through here just to give some quote examples of the stuff. So this is the current E operator that we have. Uh, and E.get of X with the property. These aren't this isn't funny syntax. This is all legitimate JavaScript syntax. So E.get is necessary for a property lookup versus just E of X to do a function call or a method call, E of X with the property in args. And so this is the chaining case where you have an outside E matching up prints here. Let's see. Ah, yes. Outside E closes here and then calls method on some arguments. Uh, and inner D uh, looks up a sub property of uh, an invocation of X with arguments. And next slide. Oof. There you go. That's what uh, the eventual client looks like. Is you get the same same ability to specify options to your to your method, uh, but the chaining is all there. And oh, does, does O also does O also have a second options argument paralleling what we had proposed for E? Uh, it has room for it, and it's going to have it once the handle promise layer that I'm kind of rebuilding has somewhere to put that. Right. And, but yeah, every eventual operation it has an options argument, basically. Okay. Um, and eventual operations is the next part. So used to be eventual operations were all stuck on the handle promise global, um, which was all okay, but then got really unfortunate when we wanted to do dot apply because the handle promise global is itself a function and it had an apply method of its own where you could apply the handle promise global to itself, to arguments. Uh, so we had to call the eventual operation apply function or apply method for consistency. In the new proposal, we basically have just it hanging off of promise and the eventual object which has methods get, apply, and send for functions and methods. And I, I figured out how to do set and delete also. So I think we'll add those in to the eventual operations that you can do. And um, yeah. The, does this have, so there, there is one hole in our ability to shim that uh, we've, we've always had that we knew we could only fix by getting it into the platform, which is for a normal promise, not a ha not a handy promise. Uh, for example, the, well, the compelling example is the one that's that's uh, already returned by a call to an async function. Um, is that if the body of the async function returns a handy promise, um, but uh, a message had been sent to the, had already been sent to the promise that was immediately returned by the call to the async function. There was no way to pipeline those messages because we had, there's no way for the shim to tell that the non handled promise that was already returned had been forwarded to the handled promise. There was no place to stand to intercept to react to that forward to the forwarding of the non-handled promise in, in order to forward the messages that had been eventually sent to the non-handled promise. And this is where promise steps, also known as vows in the Agoric platform, come in. And they're basically objects that have promise-like semantics, but they don't have a then method. So they do not they do not uh, get assimilated by a promise. They get 
uh, returned as if it was the terminal result of the province, the settlement of it. And um, that's how you would implement pipelining in a function where you could return a vow. And the vows are typically used at the outside of a VAT rather than within VAT functions. So if you need to communicate with an outside VAT, uh, the pipelining would be in effect at that point. Even so if this would, this would, okay, so, so what we're seeing here does not heal the rift between promises and vow. Uh, not inherently, but it will. Uh, the implementation that is sensitive to promise steps or to vows um, will heal the rift and it will do so because we're not just hacking around E anymore. We actually have better integration between O and the underlying vow system. Partly because we're working with um, Exos. But yeah, that comes later. Uh, I'll pop over to this. There, so this Mark, answers. There's some, there, there's some good questions up in chat. How does this um, how does this arrive in Endo? Is this a, is this a sublibrary of eventual send that can be imported as an alternative to the E operator? Does it arrive as a, like a make O function? Uh, it is a make O function, and uh, shimming the, the different parts of uh, wherever we choose to put them around promise or on new globals. Um, the decisions to do that, I, I still imagine, will be within endo eventual send. Because initially, we're just going to be leveraging the same handle promise machinery, but putting a new API on it. So so yeah, and, and you're imagining that there would be an alternate O porcelain on top of the underlying eventual send plumbing. Um, mm. at least temporarily, and it's your your goal to eventually sink that porcelain into the plumbing, maybe. Uh, yeah, somewhat in the same way E is. That I see O as a as a library, strictly a library that happens to use some of these functionality. Yeah. Okay. And, so um, if, yeah, that's consistent with my understanding. Yeah. Uh, this was to answer. Um, your question, Chris, around what if promises get queues and we don't have to, or what if they get the ability to do eventual queuing? Um, these are the different things that we are interested in. Like we have a handle promise handler that intercepts a method application, just as a proxy would intercept a regular application. Um, this is how we use a handle promise with a handler. Uh, and we can also create a regular object freshly so that nobody can take over the handlers for the object that we made. And um, it's just showing the various contortions one has to go through to use the handle promise constructor to create different flavors of things. Um, um, we had an extension that created a fresh proxy that had a handler as well as the proxy. And so, uh, Eric, I wanted you to look at that slide very closely. <laughs> um, in particular, uh, yeah, uh, Michael, can you show the previous? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. I um, there is a very subtle detail that is hinted at here, and that is that you. This is the current API as we're using it today in Endo. Um, and not the aspirational promise delegate, which we haven't implemented. The handled promise constructor gives you the ability to essentially um, define behavior for uh, the handling eventual send through the E operator. The E operator takes a second argument that Mark alluded to, which is essentially an options bag for a method invocation. Um, Mark also asked whether that would the whether we pre, uh, whether the O zone um, continues to thread that. Michael, is that the case? Is there a second argument to the O operator? 
there isn't a second argument to the E operator yet. So that was just part of aspirational things in the standard. Um, in, the e, in the E operator, there isn't a second? No, it, it's not used. It's, it's not used, but but it is passed through to the um, to the apply methods, which then ignore it. Is that not not the case? It's not passed through to any of the handlers. No. Oh, it's not. Oh, no. I I, I, I haven't had any time to work on this stuff. <laughs> okay. I, I definitely but, see that there is a place for them though in the current yeah. AI, and yeah. and that's relevant because um, one of the one of the ways to make the, the OCAP kernel more ergonomic might involve using that feature to do some pet name dancing uh, so that you can create a retention path for the result before um, what, when, when you send an invocation. Um, I did not follow that. Yeah. The, um, the ergonomic, one of the ergonomic woes of the pet daemon api as written is that it isn't just working with objects there's this other formula layer that you're interacting with and the reason you're interacting with that formula layer is to make an explicit distinction between what things exist in the ephemeral reference graph through captp from the uh, the durable reference graph through formulas and they're distinct because the, the the formula graph is less expressive. It isn't able to construct. Uh, it, it's you, we are unable to create formulas for um, for so that, like it, cycles are inexpressible, where over CAPTP cycles are expressible, um, and uh, and and the formula layer can be ref counted, whereas the um, Whereas the ephemeral CAPTP references um, re would rely upon a finalization registry and would not be able to rely on timely, uh, timely distributed GC, much less timely local GC, since the GC isn't guaranteed to visit the entire, uh, isn't uh, isn't guaranteed to collect every um, every unreachable object on any particular GC generational cycle. So those those are the big differences. But that comes with an ergonomic cost because you have to interact with the 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 pet name, the the agent API in order to construct a formula um, for an arbitrary operation where it would be much more desirable to just use eventual send and have a handler that can say, "Hey, I'm going to create a formula that corresponds to method invocation on this previous formula," or uh, this corresponds to get, set, or delete operations and then it can construct formulas out of eventual send op ops um and that introduces an interesting race for purposes of ref counting and retention of the results because the rule is for the for the pet demon that uh any any unreachable formula is immediately collectible at the end of the turn it becomes unreachable um which means that you have to pet name the result of an operation before sending that message in order to have a guarantee that it'll be retained um and one possible way to do that would be to have a reference through a handled promise that recognizes an additional property saying, this is the pet name I wish to retain the result by. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, it does to me, I think Mark was answering it too. Cool. Um, in any case, what I've learned from this conversation, Eric and Michael, is that there is a hole where this feature is planned but not yet present in in eventual send um, you have a promise for this option yeah I'll say this yeah yeah ah. <laughs> Wait, the... look, let me let me let me just mention the the um original motivating case for the, the for this option bag on eventual send uh which is still motivating um which is um 
uh, in thinking about eventual the constraints on doing eventual sin where some of the participant endpoints are blockchains, uh, we have backed off from um, spe from, from requiring e-order uh, as the message delivery ordering constraint of just normal eventual sends. It's just too costly. And generally, point-to-point -point FIFO satisfies most needs, but sometimes it doesn't. So um, uh, something that's more general than e-order um, in its expressiveness um, uh, and has has some other interesting features is an after option where you get to um, do an eventual send, but say this message should only be delivered to the target after the following promise has settled. So to condition a delivery on the settling of some other promise um, and uh, we have not implemented that. There's actually, it's quite challenging to implement it, uh, but it's much more expressive than e-order and enables us to impose the e-order constraints that are left out of point-to-point -point FIFO. Um, I will briefly show on this next page uh, how this gets sanitized. So we'll have an eventual factory global. We say, I'm going to make an eventual factory for a specific handler. And then you just have a bunch of factory objects or factory methods that allow you to create fresh objects with that handler. So you can resolve a promise to a resolution and that doesn't have to, um, once the promise is fully resolved, uh, once it's, once it's been fulfilled or rejected, um, that determines what the message behavior becomes. But before it's been settled, uh, the eventual handler is the one that's actually intercepting messages for that promise. So it's like you you turn, you create an object that can receive eventual methods and process them differently from proxy methods or from promise methods or whatever the object is. So um, this is one of the most more interesting ones is you can create a revocable proxy that has a target and a proxy handler that has an eventual handler also attached to it. So this was uh, done in the old way by um, a crazy proxy options thing and a handle promise that you resolve with the presence to a handler with the proxy options to get a proxy out. Yeah. Um, and you can do fun stuff. So the, the promise step stuff uh, should be based on the factory. We wanted a factory to make a valve, for example, with this specific handler. Um, yeah. And the delegating is when you say, I, I want to just layer on top of this other ob objects methods and decide how to do it. Um, and the lowest layer is this one where we're saying in the until we get uh, some kind of method or thing we can register for to see when a promise has been forwarded to another promise, uh, we can add these methods to uh, manipulate an object that has a promise step type, um, which says a step is just an object that has this notion of a resolution or a final value. Um, and we can construct them. We can explicitly say advance to the next step um, or the final value for each of these things. It's a bit tricky to under, to explain, and the where it starts to make sense is when we go into actual objects that represent promises, as opposed to using platform promises for this. Yes, sir. Oh, bye. <laughs> that was a goodbye. Um,
yeah, so that was the the meat of the presentation. Well, I think it was totally awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing this. This is a really creative solution to a to a tricky problem. No, thank you. Really good time for. It's a terrible time, but it's a good time. It's the best time we're going to get for questions. I see questions in the chat. It's been zipping by. Leverage the local lexical scope is the pet name system. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think Chris had uh, good good answers for that. It, we're basically balancing how to tell the remote that they should keep a reference around. Uh, if I'm if I'm following right, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and it isn't just necessarily lexical scope. It's uh, even an um, automatically persisted exo pet store um, would be rooted in language level retention of references. Yeah, we have we have a we have a lot to mull. <laughs> um, so um, the the next side of the demo that I'd like to complete before showing off the next bit is um wiring up the REPL to some objects that would represent the agoric chain, for example, or to other evaluators like Xnapplasm or things like that that we could run in the browser, and then. Um, have a way to be able to choose the, the object that does the, the that speaks the REPL protocol so that you can do evaluation in different contexts. And that should be a lot of fun. Yes. Michael, you want to carry that over to, uh, you want to carry that over, over to a, a future a future meeting? Uh, yes, it right. will not be, it's not done yet. <laughs> All right, yeah. cool. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that with this, there'll be, um, uh, you, you're about to receive a lot of pestering about when, when can I use O, um, and we can talk about that out of band. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Uh, very informative. Yeah. Lot to unpack here. Thanks again. Thanks. Appreciate it.